We're talking today about the uh, murder of Arliss Perry, uh, which is, um, was suggested is probably the biggest unsolved crime in this county's history. Um, and the reason for that is where it occurred, the Stanford Memorial Church, uh, how it occurred, and it's pretty graphic, we'll get to that for a moment, and the fact that the killer has never been found. Um, if they, the killer today would probably be in his mid-60s, we're fairly certain this was a male. Uh, and uh, so if they're ever found through DNA or through some fluke, I'm, uh, I'm quitting my day job and going to try to write a book about this. Um, Arliss Perry, who was born Arliss Dykema, was a 19-year-old woman from Bismarck, North Dakota. And in the fall of 1974, she had just married her boyfriend, longtime boyfriend, Bruce. Now, this is an older photo of Bruce Perry. This is not him as a, but he was a sophomore uh, at Stanford at the time. Um, and so she, uh, she moved out with him and they lived in married student housing at Stanford. And she, uh, she found it hard to uh, acclimate to California. She was um, a very religious young woman, uh, sensitive, uh, maybe uh, not quite used to California and its, uh, its many loosey-goosey ways. Um, one night, she and Bruce walked out. Uh, they were gonna mail a letter. And uh, Bruce said something to her about uh, keeping the tire pressure up in the tires. Uh, well, all of us who have been married have these kinds of modest little spats, but it, it happened to hit Arliss at a bad time, and so she said something very tart back to him and left uh, and went to go pray at the Stanford Memorial Church. Here's uh, the Memorial Church, which you all know, Mem Chu, as it was known then. Uh, this was about 11 o'clock at night on October 12th, 1974. Um, and uh, some of the later uh, stories said it was about 11.30, but I'm convinced it was actually a little earlier than that because she was spotted inside the church at around 11.10 or 11.15. She was in about the 11th or the 12th row from the front, uh, and she was praying. Uh, like I say, she was a very religious young woman. She belonged to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Obviously, this little spat with her husband set off something. Um, at about 11.30, 11.35, the night watchman, um, a man by the name of Steve Crawford, and he will figure in our tale here, comes down and by his account, he walked about halfway down the church. Um, here's the inside. He walked about halfway down the aisle and said, we're gonna be closing up in about 15 minutes. And uh, he did not see, or he said he did not see Arliss at that point, but there were other people who did and at least saw a young blonde woman praying in about the 11th or 12th pew from the front. Uh, anyway, Crawford locked up the church, probably about quarter to 12, maybe 10 to 12. He said he did another check. He was the night watchman. He did another check of the church about 2 o'clock, didn't find anything. But at 5.40 in the morning, he found a body um, in the east transept, which as you look at the church is to your left and near the front. Um, it was partially covered by a pew, uh, and it was laid out in really grotesque fashion. And I need to give anybody a warning here. Um, this is pretty graphic stuff. Uh, if you don't want to hear it, you can cover your ears, but uh, it is crucial to this case. So let me just describe what it looked like. Um, Arliss was spread eagled on her back, her head sort of lolled, lolled a little to the left. Uh, her right arm was sort of palm down and underneath her waist. Um, she was naked from the waist down. 
Uh, her sweater had been pulled up and her jacket had been opened and a uh, large altar candle had been shoved up her vagina. Another altar candle had been stuck between her breasts with so much force that it broke her bra straps. And around her neck looked like ligature, or a purple ligature wound that matched um, the necklace she had. She had a wooden kind of bead necklace and the, the, um, the wounds on the neck seemed to look like somebody perhaps had grabbed the necklace and tried to choke her with it. She was dead, uh, obviously, and uh, the first thing that um, Crawford did was he called it in, and it's a very strange way to report it, but he said, hey, we've got a stiff here. Um, so finally the sheriff's investigators show up and they begin looking at this, and uh, this kind of thing did not happen very often. I mean, almost never. Uh, uh, laid out in a sort of almost ritual fashion inside a church. Um, and they quickly began to sort of work on the theory that this was a, uh, a random intruder. Somebody maybe who had followed her on campus, followed her into the church, waited until it closed, and then uh, maybe choked her. Uh, those were all the opening kind of possibilities. Um, what they didn't know until they actually did an autopsy of her body was that she died from an ice pick to the brain. The ice pick um, was shoved behind her left ear up at about a 45 degree angle into the brain and that is what killed her. Whatever the, the ligature wound was on her neck was not the fatal thing, it was the ice pick to the brain. And the killer had broken off the handle that's one reason why they didn't know it at first. It was simply the, the five inch uh, blade, if you will, of, of the ice pick left, left in her head. Well, obviously, in, in a case like this, there, there are two suspects immediately, and the cops had to, the sheriff's investigators had to eliminate those. One was her, her husband, um, and the second was uh, Steve Crawford. And uh, with her husband, it was really very easy. He was. Uh, he was completely distraught. He took a lie detector test and passed it. And later on, he even gave them um, DNA. Uh, Arliss was not raped, but there was a pillow found near the body where there was some semen. And it was theorized that perhaps the killer, after he had laid her out in this ritual fashion, had, had masturbated. Um, but this was in the era before DNA. So all they were really able to tell is that the semen matched a type O blood type, which of course is, what, 40% of, of people. Uh, so that did not help them a lot. Um, and over the years, that pillow has been cut numerous times, so often that um, if they ever do match it with DNA, uh, probably a defense attorney is gonna have a a good argument about them mishandling the chain of evidence, which you've heard before, I'm certain if you've followed crime. Anyway, um, they pretty soon figured out it was not the husband, and they also figured out it was probably not Steve Crawford for all his, his weirdness. Um, he was able to say that he had been around campus checking other places that night. Uh, he was not completely eliminated, but my information is that they finally, I think, have gotten some DNA from him and it, it does not match. Um, Steve, we'll come back to Steve Crawford for a minute though, uh, because he was, a, he was a strange guy and, and maybe you can't completely subtract him from the story. Anyway, the, the sheriff's um, deputies began operating on the idea that this was a, a random intruder who had followed her, but there were a couple of strange things about this case. One is that on Friday, October 11th, which is one day before the killing, um, she was, uh, maybe accosted is too strong a word, but uh, a young man came into the law firm where she was working. It was uh, Valentine and Klein and Spieth, I think, uh, the Palo Alto law firm where she was working. And um, they went into the conference room and somebody saw them. They were having a kind of a heated uh, argument, I guess you might say. Um, but nobody got a really good description of this young man, only that he was about 
510 medium build sandy colored hair. Uh, and you know, again, that fits probably 40% of, of folks. There was one other strange thing. Um, her husband's name was Bruce Duncan Perry. Uh, and there was another Bruce Duncan Perry li listed at Stanford by the telephone company during the first a uh, few weeks of the semester of 1974. Um, after her killing, the second Bruce Perry disappeared, and the telephone company has no records of where he went to. Uh, Arliss actually, for some reason, found out that there was a second Bruce Duncan Perry and mentioned to her husband how, how strange this was. It may have nothing to do with the killing, but on the other hand, it's, it's one of those things you, you have to look at. In any case, the sheriff's deputies uh, threw the net very wide here. Uh, they even tried to find out where Ted Bundy was at the moment Arliss Perry was killed, and, and they actually tracked it down. He was uh, buying gas in Utah at the moment she was killed, so he could be uh, eliminated as a, as a possibility. They looked at a man who had uh, committed uh, an ice pick killing, or excuse me, a, a candle violation killing back in 1965 uh, and they were pretty sure that it was it was not him um, but maybe maybe the strangest thing of all was uh, that a an investigative reporter from Long Island by the name of Maury Terry did a story or actually a book that tried to link um, Arliss Perry with the son of Sam David Berkowitz here's his book the ultimate evil. Uh, and Terry's whole thesis was that uh, Arliss uh, ran with uh, various cult figures in Bismarck, North Dakota, North Dakota, that one of these people had followed her out to Stanford. And uh, at one point, um, the son of Sam Berkowitz did write a letter to investigators saying that he knew something about the killing. Uh, they went and they interviewed him, and they were convinced that he was simply playing them along. Uh, I don't think the son of Sam had much to do with this. Uh, my two cents here uh, is that, well, back up for a second. Several years ago, I was interested in trying to do a longer piece on this, and I went to uh, uh, one of the really the best homicide investigators in the county, a guy who used to work for um, San Jose Police named Mike Shembry. And Shembry, at one point, although it was not his case, this is a sheriff's case, had taken a look at the file, and he said, the, uh, the whole random intruder idea is just flat wrong. Uh, and the, the key thing here to remember is that it took the killer a while to lay out Arliss's body uh, to use the candles to ooh, masturbate if that's what he was doing. All this took a good half hour, 45 minutes. It needed to be somebody who knew the schedule of the church, somebody who was familiar with how the church operated, which of course pointed maybe to an insider or to somebody just who went to the church quite often. Um, I, I tend to think this is right. There's also Two other things. One is where this occurred. I mean, if this were somebody who had a, a grudge against Arliss, um, it might have occurred almost anywhere. Uh, that it occurred inside the church, I think, tells you something um, maybe about the killer. Uh, the FBI did a, um, a kind of profile of the killer, and uh, they didn't give a great deal, but what they said was likely to be a loner. Uh, probably 17 to 22 years old, um, a guy who probably took a trophy and uh, keeps a detailed diary. Now, in fact, there was one thing missing. Um, Arliss's uh, glasses were missing, and she was very nearsighted. Uh, the theory is that maybe the killer took the glasses. There's, there's one other thing about the way her body was laid out. Her jeans were taken off and uh, laid over the body with the bottoms of the jeans facing up toward her head in a kind of a Y pattern like this. Um, now I have a religious background. My, my father was a Lutheran minister here in Palo Alto and there is a, 
Um, there is a religious symbol called the cross in the chalice. This looked very much like this. And so I would be willing to bet that um, the killer knew something about religion. Um, it's also possible, um, well, it's almost certain that the killer is left-handed. Uh, because if you're going to kill somebody with an ice pick to the head, and the ice pick goes in just behind the left ear, you're almost certainly doing, almost certainly doing it with your left hand. Think about trying to cross over and do it with your right hand, backhand, it just, it just would not work. So the killer is almost certainly left-handed. And given the sort of effectiveness of that, may have special forces training. Um, Steve Crawford did not. Um, by the way, Shembri, Shembri did talk to Steve Crawford and was convinced uh, the guy did not um, have the wherewithal to, to pull off a crime like this. Um, Crawford was a strange character, though, and he came back in, in, a, in history in, a, in an odd way. Um, he, had, um, he had always been a little unhappy with Stanford because he had been a Stanford cop and actually carried a gun at one point, and in the early 70s they reorganized the police department, and he was essentially demoted to night watchman. Uh, he didn't like that and complained about it, and later on he, uh, he exacted his own sort of revenge. He got into the Stanford office where they kept the, the sheepskins, the empty diplomas. And he took out a diploma and had his own name engraved on it as graduating from Stanford and put it on his wall. Um, and he probably would have gotten away with that. I don't think they necessarily number all the sheepskins they have. But um, he underwent a divorce in the early 90s and his wife, very thoughtfully called the cops on him. And uh, so there was a police report taken on that. I still do not think that Crawford, for all his weirdness, uh, was, was the killer here. Um, there was something tremendously twisted uh, about the killer. And as I say, I, I believe it had some kind of religious overtone, some kind of religious background, maybe. So that's, uh, that's it. Um, you know, the, the case is still open. The sheriff's uh, department would obviously like to try to solve this one. I think if, uh, if I were to give any critique, I would say that they probably wasted their time in looking for the random intruder, that they should have focused on the inside right from the start. But that's hindsight. Thanks.